Hi, Amanda here from Realize Beauty and today I'm going to walk you through how to formulate a water-based serum like this one. This is one I've made earlier and um, what I'm going to say is the most important thing about a water-based serum is how it flows, how it comes out of the pack. So let's open this one and try it on my hand. So if you look at this, squeezing it out there, you see it nicely drip across the surface. That is perfect. So it is going to glide across the surface of my skin and it goes in really really beautifully what we're looking for is a product that doesn't blob out like jelly and it doesn't sort of what do we say soap up when we rub it on the skin um, what it needs to do is glide across the surface really smoothly really easily and sort of glide and glide and glide because what the serum is doing is being an active delivery base for all the lovely actives and um, moisturizing ingredients that you're going to want to put in there so it needs to cover the surface evenly cleanly and um, smoothly so let's go to the lab and find out what ingredients are going to make that happen Amanda from Realize Beauty and here I am in the lab. So um, now we're going to get on with making this serum. We need to look at what ingredients we're going to need. The most important ingredient is water. This is a water-based serum and um, really, really important to have water that's clean. I always use demineralized water to start off with in my formulas. Um, you might choose to use a hydrosol or um, a liquid extract or, or whatever. The most important thing is that you've got a specification for the microbial contamination that could be in there. Um, if you start off with dirty water or dirty liquid, you're going to end up with a dirty product and your preservative is going to have an extra hard time trying to keep that preserved. So um, demin water is just pure H2O, very, very easy to work with, very predictable, and that's why I like to start with it. So there's my water. Then we've got some humectants. Humectants are water binding ingredients, and in this formula, water binding is really important. So let me just show you this one. It's not very exciting. That is panthenol. Panthenol vitamin B5 plays an important role in many skin um, metabolism processes. But um, even if it doesn't get very far, even if your formula just kind of sits on the skin and doesn't really do any more than that, it will still do you some good because of the fact that it binds water to it, moisture to it, and then allows um, your skin to be moisturized or added water to it over a longer period of time. So um, if it does manage to get deeper into the dermis, then um, it can do some good, some extra good. But if not, not to worry. This one here, wah, which I've nearly spilt, but I didn't quite, that's got glycerin in. Glycerin is a really cheap humectant. Um, by cheap, we sometimes think, oh God, well, it mustn't be very good then if it's that cheap. Well, it's cheap because it's a byproduct of saponification. Um, it's naturally found in oils, which is odd because it's water soluble. But what happens is the oils get split. The triglycerides um, get split up. The fatty acids go one way and the glycerin comes out. And we use that as an ingredient for skincare. Glycerin is an awesome water binder. Like I said, it's very cost effective. So we're using it in this formula to increase the moisture content and um, keep the skin happy. Our skin cells are two thirds water. So um, rather than just being a cheap filler, which I sometimes hear it being called, water is actually really, really important. So having the glycerin in this formula is not a bad thing at all. So there's our humectants and our water. Then we come to these little powders over here, which are, they don't look exciting, but they kind of are. So this one here, is our acacia and xanthan gum. That's the gum that I'm going to be using to make the bulk of the um, the serum. That's going to give us the, the serum's viscosity, really. Um, and then in this one, I've got carrageenan gum. Now, carrageenan is a type of seaweed. The reason I'm using carrageenan in this formula is because seaweed's very slimy and slippy. And as long as you don't go overboard, a little bit of slime and slip is actually really good for a serum. Chemically, hyaluronic acid is a glycosaminoglycan. It's been found that as we age, the levels of these GAGs, um, glycosaminoglycans, reduce over time. So they reduce both with chronological aging, that's just as we get more birthdays and we get older. Uh, they've also been found to reduce in the skin after UV damage and environmental um, aging, so extrinsic aging, aging that comes from the environment. Um, so adding a bit of hyaluronic acid into your skincare can be quite good um, to help you recover your to help your skin recover from those environmental signs of aging, and it can also be relatively good for for um, general aging. Having said that, hyaluronic acid, even if it's a small molecular weight, low molecular weight HA, it's going to be too big to penetrate through the skin very deeply. So generally speaking. 
We put it in a serum because it's able to deliver other things through the skin and in this case it's going to help us deliver our panthenol and um, any other actives that we decide to put in this formula um, and it's going to act as a powerful moisturizer and it's going to feel awesome so it has got many benefits but actually penetrating through and replacing those naturally um, lost hyaluronic acids possibly not okay so now it's time to look and see what i've got in these two containers here so this one is my preservative and this one is my chelating agent it's really really important that you have a look at your preservation strategy before you start formulating because there's many many choices of preservative and chelating agent out there but um, if you don't get one that's right for your formula you may as well not bother you're going to end up with micro issues straight off the bat which isn't a good thing people will often say to me well how long will something last if i keep it in the fridge or um you know if i put it in airless packaging or whatever i mean i can't tell you a golden answer to that because every formula is different but what i can say is that the times when i forgot to put a preservative in my formula it's lasted no more than a week before i've started to see some issues come up especially in the summer probably a little bit longer in the winter but you know a week's not long enough not long enough for a cosmetic to last and that's the stuff that you can see um, who knows what's going on with the bacteria that you really can't see so um, my preservative I've chosen a broad spectrum preservative so it looks after my bacteria yeast and mold um, and I'm going to use um, industry standard amount of that so for this particular preservative it's about one percent you can't Re really decide well I only want to use half a percent or I want to blend it with something else unless you test and the test that we recommend for a water-based serum um, or an oil in water cream is the preservative efficacy test that's an industry standard um, if you're not going to invest in that sort of testing and it can be quite expensive then all you can do is use your preservatives at the maximum amount that the um, supplier has recommended for your formula that's the only safe thing you can really do so this in here is a chelating agent. It's like the best buddy for the preservative. It's got its back. And um, basically how chelating agents work is that they mop up any impurities in your formula that could actually feed and um, help grow bacteria, yeast and mold. So it's kind of like um, works to starve those microorganisms to death, which is actually quite cool really in a formula. And that's what we want it to do. So I'm using sodium phytate in this formula because it's natural. It also comes as a liquid, as you can see here. The most common um, chelating agent that we're using in cosmetics is EDTA. Um, but EDTA is not a natural chelating agent. And there was some concerns over it not um, breaking down, not biodegrading um, well enough in normal soil conditions. Um, and that gave rise to a number of other technologies, um, variations on EDTA, other powdered ingredients that you can put into your formula. So there's basically lots of choice when it comes to chelating agents, just as there's lots of choice with your preservative. Um, how do you choose? Well, you need to look at your ingredient philosophy. Does it have to be natural or not? Um, price, availability, is it NICNAS registered in Australia or is it regulated? Um, is it allowable in your regulations wherever you are in the world? Um, the other thing is, is it going to destabilize your formula? Some of these things can be quite active and they can make a formula thinner um, or they can turn it a different color. Obviously, this one's got a slight color. And in my serum, we're going to see that because the serum's um, sort of semi clear. Um, and yeah, the other thing you need to pay attention to is what pH is best for the chelating agent um, because they have their preference. And if this works best at pH 8, but my preservative works best at pH 6 or 5, what am I going to do? I'm going to be compromising one of them. And on a preservative strategy, we don't really want to compromise on every, anything. So um, they're my last two ingredients. These are all my things. Now let's get on with them um, with having a look at the next thing. Okay, so now we're going to get making the serum. We need to have a bit of equipment. And the first bit of equipment here is my pH meter. And I've got that in my buffer solution. This is a pH 7 buffer. And as you can see, my pH meter is reading 7. So that's calibrated. Um, really, really important to calibrate your pH meter and to 
have a pH meter before you start because if you haven't got one, you can't make a safe product. Um, a lot of the preservatives that we prefer to use these days, the natural ones, um, they're very pH dependent. They won't work if they're at a pH of say six or seven. Um, some of them work best under pH five. It's, it, they're all different. You need to know the pH that your preservative will work at and you need to know the pH of your formula. You need to know how to adjust it and you need to have something to measure it with. So pH meter, really, really important. Then we've got a thermometer. Now we are going to be heating this up. Um, it's going to be fairly visual. We'll know when we're, when we're boiling it because it's water and water will bubble. We don't want to boil it though. So we're going to use our thermometer just to make sure that we're at the right sort of temperature. You want to be around 70, 75 degrees so that you can make sure that any microbes that are coming into the formula are, are killed off, but you don't really want the, um, the water to bubble and boil because if it bubbles and boils, you're going to lose a, quite a lot through evaporation a lot quicker than you would if it's at a lower temperature. The other thing that's going to happen is all that bubbling is going to cause bubbles that are then going to get stuck as your um, formula thickens up and then you're going to have a bubbly serum you might think well does that matter yes it does because bubbles are air and air can cause oxidation and if you've got ingredients in your formula that are um, oxidatively unstable or unstable sorry then um, then you're going to be giving them a feast of oxygen and you're going to be breaking down your product quicker so we're going to try and avoid having too much air in the formula Spatula, good old spatula, scales, we need some scales, these are mine, they've got, um, they're not exactly fancy and they're a bit old now, but um, they will measure down to 0 0.1 um, decimal place and accurate. They also stay on all the time, it's really important with your lab scales that they don't go off, these are, um, are plugged in. Um, if you're using kitchen scales, what you can find is that you're delicately measuring something out and then this kitchen scales go off, not a good thing, um, so yeah, buy proper scales. Then what have we got? Um, then it's just the mixer and the mixer, we, we've got a mixing head like this. This is my propeller head for the mixer. Um, I generally use this for most things to get started. We're only going to make a small batch size, 200 grams, because it's a trial. It's just a trial base and that will give us enough to get a good look at this. This propeller mixer is, is ideal because it forms a nice vortex in the water. It's easy to control the, um, the spinning and um, the aeration of the product. It won't make it too bubbly and airy. So that's what we need. Let's get on with it. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have this stirring on um, just a gentle speed. So I've got it on the lowest setting and I'm going to pop in my um, chelating agent because we are, um, this is heat stable. We're able to put this in now. So I'm just going to drop that in. It's fully water soluble, so it will disappear straight in. You won't really see anything exciting. Um, then I'm going to put my preservative in because um, the preservative is also heat stable. So even if we heat this up to 80, 90 degrees, it's really not going to affect my preservative. Really important to know that about your preservative. Is it going to be heat stable? Is it heat stable or not? Because if it's not, then you wouldn't be adding it in this phase. You'll add it at the end. So I'm just dropping that in and making sure that I've got the appropriate amount because I'm weighing it on here. So um, all good. That will get mixing. This will take a, a second to just sort of mix in with the water. That's absolutely fine. The, the next important thing with this um, formula is the mixing of the powders because um, we really want those to go in nicely into the water. So I'm heating the water up now, it's on a hot plate and I'm going to hopefully get that up to about 70 degrees before I start mixing the powders in. I'm going to, um, instead of adding the powdered ingredients, that's the gums um, and the hyaluronic acid as powders, I'm going to make them into a paste um, using the glycerin and possibly the panthenol as well, in fact yeah, the panthenol as well, um, because that will then help me to incorporate them better. So let's get on with that. Okay, so there's the glycerin, and um, I'm just adding in the carrageenan, and there's the acacia xanthan gum, pop that in. Um, this is the panthenol. Panthenol is very sticky. This is 100% panthenol. You can get different grades of, um, of panthenol. So um, some of them are more watery than others. It's just important to talk to your um, material supplier and find out what grades are available and what best suits your need. 
It's the D-panthenol, the isomer, the D-isomer of panthenol that's biologically active. If you get D-L, it's the L won't have any um, biological activity. This only really matters in terms of um, what it might do in, under the skin, you know, into the dermis. It, it, both of them will still be humectants and both of them will still help moisturize the skin and do a number of other things but um, you're only going to get that um, sort of deep biological activity with the D-panthenol but you know in a cosmetic formulas you may not you may not achieve that anyway it just depends on on how your formula goes so that's that and then we've got another um, powder to put in this is the hyaluronic acid so we're going to pop that in too in it goes um, let's get all of it hyaluronic acid is quite an expensive material I'm using um, a reasonable amount here actually um, for this formula because for a serum you can generally attract quite a high price for that sort of product and uh, people do expect a nice luxurious feel they expect deep moisturization and they expect a nice flow so the hyaluronic acid high molecular weight does achieve all of those and for the um, amount that I've got in it's it's still competitive price wise in the formula so I'm quite happy with that now as you can see from what I'm doing here I've actually formed a paste with all those ingredients and what that's going to do is it's just going to enable them to combine with the water in my um, heating water mixture over there and it will stop them from sticking to to themselves and fall, forming clumps or what we call fish eyes so it just means that I'm going to get a smoother paste and I'm going to get a smoother serum base formed without any of the lumpiness and that's going to save me time and energy when I'm manufacturing so we're about ready now to add the powders to the water but before we do that I want to just take the temperature of the water to make sure it's up to the right level. We were looking for around 70 degrees because at that temperature it's just about hot enough to sterilise the water, pasteurise the water a little bit um, and it's not too hot that it's going to start bubbling and disappearing. So let's go and have a measure of that and see how we're standing. So our water's on the mixer and it's stirring around and um, I just want to point out to you what a vortex is because I sometimes talk about vortexes and adding things into the vortex. The vortex is that bit in the middle where the um, mixer is creating like a whirlpool in the water so we can see it from the side here as well, it's really cool. Um, you see how that's the mixer head, the propeller head's kind of like, ooh, what would it be, maybe a couple of centimetre centimeter below the start of the vortex you ideally want all of the water to be mixed so my uh, mixing head could be a tad lower could be a little bit lower just so that that vortex is a little bit deeper but we can address that in a minute because I'm going to stop the mixer now so let's stop the mixer the mix is currently on 460 rpm so let's stop that and um, I'm just going to have to stop the camera so that I can take the water out so I've took the water out and I'm just um, taking the temperature now, so let's get a reading. Yeah, it's 73 degrees centigrade or 163 Fahrenheit. So um, that's absolutely perfect because we wanted it to be about that hot. So look, you can see that it's steaming but it's not boiling. This is the perfect temperature now for adding our powders. So I'm going to return it back onto the hot plate, but this time I'm going to turn the hot plate down. So the hot plate is still going to be warm, but um, it's not going to be heating it up anymore. So let's get on with that and then we can add our powders. Okay, so now we're at the point that we can actually start adding the powders into this mixture. So I'm going to turn the... Um, the dial up a little bit you can see in there it's going to go a little bit quicker and then we're going to add our paste so let's start adding that now and you can see I'm going to try and add it into the vortex so this is a really important um, step when you're making a serum that you're adding the um, the thickeners and the um, ingredients that are going to swell in water you're adding them nice and slowly into the vortex so that they can swell up without sticking to each other. When you scale this sort of formula up, this really, really matters because if you get this part wrong and you're making a, um, I mean, even a hundred kilo, especially a ton batch, you can end up mixing this for ages, and that's going to cost you a heck of a lot of money in man hours and um, tying up that piece of equipment. So, what might seem a trivial thing in the lab when you're making 200 grams really, really does make a difference when you're on the factory floor. Okay, so that's got them all in, and that has hydrated really, really nicely. I'm going to turn the heat off, the heat's off, 
Um, and I'm just going to let that all just mix around for a little bit longer because that hyaluronic acid really needs to swell up nicely before the job's, um, before I can say the job's done. Or else we're just going to end up with only half the activity that we want out the hyaluronic acid. Okay. I've got the mixer on around 1000 RPM and as you sort of follow it down here, into the beaker we can see that's actually quite fast and if I put my spatula in here now you'll start to see that there's definitely a nice gel texture forming down there as we cool down the serum. So like I said I'm just going to leave that mixing just for a little bit longer. I might take the speed down to about 500-600 rpm just when I'm sure that all of that powder has had a chance to hit the water and to start um, fully hydrating because then we'll be able to tell exactly what viscosity and rheology we're getting when this cools down and um, we're not going to have any surprises or any lumps in the formula. So you can also you might be able to see that it's a nice, it's got a nice sort of glossy finish to it. It all goes together really nicely, comes together really nicely. It's not sort of blobbing around the outside of the beaker. Um, that's a good sign. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is take the temperature because I believe it's come down to um, room temperature now. So I'm just going to do that and have a look. It's come down to about 27 or 82 Fahrenheit, so that's absolutely fine. Um, we're about ready to add a fragrance if we wanted to add um, either a perfume or an essential oil um, blend. Um, we can do that now. So I'm just going to speed it up a tad. We've got a uh, completely water formulation here but we're still able to add a little bit of oil to it because of the viscosity and the structure of the gels will hold a little bit of oil but if we start adding too much then we might get into trouble so what I'm going to do is add um, about 0.2% um, which is exactly that actually which was a good good guess 0.2% uh, of an essential oil in a hoba oil there so this is a chamomile essential oil in a hoba oil base. The reason for that is because chamomile is quite expensive so um, quite often it's sold as a 3% dilution which is what I've got in here. So now we've got a tiny bit of oil in our serum, just a tiny bit. But that's absolutely fine, it should mix in without a problem and we're still going to get a relatively clear formula so I just need to make sure that's all incorporated so I give it a bit more of a whiz and while I'm doing that I'm going to talk to you about the colour of this serum. Now this serum isn't crystal clear, it's kind of cloudy and that's absolutely fine too. This is a natural product, the um, natural gums will give that sort of opacity to it. If you wanted a crystal clear serum you could replace the acacia xanthan gum um, and the carrageenan for something like a carbomer and a carbomer will give you that crystal clarity. So would uh, hydroxyethyl cellulose gum or some of the other types of modified cellulose gum. They'll also give you a clear product. But generally speaking, people who are looking for natural formulas don't so much mind if it's not quite crystal clear. So this is absolutely fine for, for what we're doing. I think we've got it now. I think the oil has all gone in. Now if you wanted to add any other ingredients, any other actives, um, herbal actives, that sort of things, you could do it at this point in the formula because it's cooled down, um, the gums have hydrated. So there's really okay, so all that's left to do now is take the pH of the formula and then we should be done. So that's what I'm doing now and if you have a look at that it says 5.3. Um, it does take a minute for a pH meter to... Um, read a thick sort of solution like this so it's not that thick but um you know it's not water thin so do be patient with it give it a couple of um minutes and then re take the reading and um off you go so at around between a ph of say four and a half and six is going to be absolutely fine for this serum because we've got a preservative that's ph stable across a broad range um, if we were using a different preservative, then we might need to um, adjust the pH down to maybe 5 or 4.8, something like that. But this formula is fine. So look, it's it's gone down a little bit more. It's reading 5.2 now, but that's still absolutely fine. So I don't need to do any more to this formula. All I need to do is find something to pack it in. So let's have a look at some packaging. Now, 
Formulas um, like this, this sort of serum, once, especially once you've got other actives in, you generally put them into, um, into airless packaging because then you're going to reduce the risk of the product oxidising and all those lovely actives and things that you might want to put in your serum base um, disappearing, breaking down and causing you problems. Oh, there we have it there's our serum in our airless pump pack and um, we can try this out and whoops there we go there it comes so let's just do that again to show you so it flows out quite nicely really important to get the right sort of pack and um, dispenser type for your product so that it comes out nicely and you get a good even dose um, if you get the proper dose on your skin then you're more likely to get a good um, efficacy a good result so that's how to make a serum, a simple serum base. Of course you can customise it your way and um, we might come back a little later and see some of the options for customisation. But um, essentially what you've got there is a really nice serum base with vitamin B5, the panthenol, with the hyaluronic acid, um, chamomile and a, hobe, a little bit of a hobe oil. Um, smells lovely, really light and gentle, um, not too sticky, goes across the skin really nice and um, yeah, perfect for getting you um, started in your journey into formulating serums. Thank you.